Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio, and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University in Shanghai, where the Sahai Weishir Collaborative Learning Project is based. Today, we want to welcome everyone to our second lecture of the 2023-2024 academic year. We're hosting Professor, Professor Michael Pewitt from Harvard University. And we have a very nice lineup of scholars from different places to discuss with Professor Pewitt. Our commentators today include Ai Yuan from Tsinghua University, Professor Li Fen from Renmin University, Professor Trenton Wilson from Princeton University, and we also have Professor Ho Jing, who's actually a colleague of mine at East China Normal University, serving as chair for this lecture. I want to thank everyone who has been invited and everyone in the audience for making this event possible. The topic of Professor Pewitt's lecture is How to Read the Past, Philosophy and History in Early China. The structure of this event is as follows. Professor Hu Jing will introduce Professor Pewitt, and then Professor Pewitt will give his talk, after which the three commentators will discuss uh, their comments with Professor Pewitt before opening the floor to comments from the audience. We'll end this event properly, promptly at 9.30 or just thereabouts, which is a little less than 90 minutes from now. Before getting things started and handing everything over to Professor Ho Jing, I want to say a few words about the Sihai Weishia Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sihai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism and self-promotion. We hope to curb all types type of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes in academic exchanges. The Sihai Weishir Collaborative Learning Project seeks to accomplish these shifts in academic, in orientation during academic exchange, by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. Before introducing our chair, Professor Ho Jing, I want to let everyone know um, a little bit about something a, li a little bit more about Professor Pewitt, um, who's someone I think that really embodies the spirit of the Sahai Weishir project. So way back when I was a PhD student, I sent Professor Pewitt an email. I don't know if you remember this. Um, this was maybe more than 12 years ago. Um, I had no sort of introduction to him. I had no way of knowing him. I just sent him an email out of the blue. And I, as I, you know, I said, I'm just this poor PhD student. I would love to send you some notes basically about my, um, PhD thesis, but he didn't really want to have an email exchange with me. Instead, he invited me to his office, and I'm pretty sure we spent more than two hours going over my thesis in detail. Um, it was really, really an amazing experience, and I'm so grateful. Um, and I think everybody who knows Professor Pewitt knows that he's a super nice guy. He's very, very honest, and he's extremely engaging. So. I really want to thank you, um, Professor Pewitt, for sharing your work with us, for sharing your time with us, and for whatever it was 12 years ago, um, some afternoon, I think it was in the fall, maybe, um, for those two hours. That was that was really um, very special. So now I want to hand things over to our chair, Professor Ho Jing. Um, when I asked her, because of course, that you ask people to write their own bios. Um, when I asked her to send me a bio, she sent me this very short sentence. Ding works in the field of philosophy and mind and social cognition with a particular focus on collective intentionality, embodiment, and we identity. So she only sent me this short sentence, but it does very little to describe her achievements. Um, Professor Ho Jing holds many positions at our university and in international committees. He has been awarded not a small number of very impressive grants. And while she claims to focus on the philosophy of mind and social cognition, 
She's also an expert in very as various aspects of cognitive science and is far more fluent in Chinese philosophy than she thinks. So um, thank you very much, Professor He Jing, for being here. And I'll hand things over to you now. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. Um, good evening, everyone. We're privileged to have an extraordinary opportunity for collaborative learning. We are honored to have a world-class philosopher with us tonight, Professor Michael Pewitt. Professor Pewitt holds the prestigious position of Walter Klein Professor of Chinese Philosophy and the Chair of the Community on the Study of Religion at Harvard University. Additionally, he's a fellow for programs in anthropological and historical science and the languages and the civilizations of East Asia at the Swedish Collegian for Advanced Study, Uppsala. Professor Pewitt works in the fields of intellectual history and philosophy with a particular focus on early China. He is the author of a number of influential monographs, including The Ambivalence of Creation, Debates Concerning Innovation and Artifice in Early China, and To Become a God, Cosmology, Sacrifice, and Self-Divinization in Early China. Furthermore, his recent work, the Path, What Chinese Philosophers Can Teach Us About the Good Life, has earned a place on the New York Times bestseller list. These three books has been translated into Chinese and published. Professor Pewitt is also a co-editor of a significant volume on ritual and its consequences. Recognized for his teaching excellence, Professor Pewitt has received multiple awards including being named Harvard College Professors, a testament to his dedication to undergrad education. We're really looking forward to his talk this evening on how to read the past, philosophy and history in early China. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Pewitt. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jean, for the much, much too nice introduction, um, but very greatly appreciated. And let me also take the moment to thank Paul as well for organizing this. Paul, this is such an exciting it, it, entire set of, of discussions that you've organized here. Um, you are truly the one who embodies the spirit of this. Um, you are such an incredibly open, engaging person, and it's wonderful that you're bringing that spirit to this group, and I'm very honored to be here. And my hope will be today to try to live up to a piece of your vision, Paul, which is to say I will be giving less a final, complete <laughs> talk to which you can give statements, um, but rather a series of thoughts about ways of thinking about philosophy and intellectual history in terms of some of the early Chinese materials, hopefully in a way that will open this up for the conversation, to which I very, very much look forward. So with that being said, let me begin with a few words about what I would like to begin this conversation about. Um, you might think from the title of the talk, that I would be talking about philosophies of history in early China, and that will certainly play into my discussion. But what I'm interested slightly more in is the question of how we read the past and what are the implications of the ways of doing that. In part, I'm also very interested in what this would mean for the role of the figure who is so reading the past and the degree to which their own placement in an historical process matters to the way they read it. Now, that's a very bizarre and abstract way of putting it. So let me start with some examples, not first from the Chinese tradition, but first from some relatively recent, meaning past three century examples in the Western tradition to give a sense of what I'm, uh, what I'm thinking about here. And I'll intentionally choose just some very well-known examples to give a, a sense of, of my concerns this morning or this evening, depending on where you are in the world. So let me begin with an obvious example, um, Kant. So to what degree does Kant's historical placement in you know, Königsberg in, in the late 18th century matter to his philosophy? As an intellectual historian, of course, I would say it matters a ton. But in terms of his own philosophical claims, it does not matter at all. So according to 
Kant's own claims, he is simply giving a critique of the possibilities of all human knowledge and therefore of all of our ways of acting properly within the world. And theoretically, this could have been done at any point in human history. He just happens to be the one who is doing it because he was awoken from his dogmatic slumber by you know, reading Hume that woke him up from the silly metaphysical discussions of the Western tradition. But all of that is happenstance in terms of his own philosophical claims. And accordingly, when he works out his arguments, his own placement in this historical process is, at least he would claim, utterly irrelevant. And accordingly, the, the historical statements that he will make comes out of such a positioning. So does he have a vision of history? Well, the answer is yes, but it's largely one of the degree to which people did or did not understand both the strengths and limitations of possible human knowledge in the world. So it so happens that the Western philosophical tradition had, had trapped itself in these metaphysical discussions that went beyond the possibilities of human reason, and because of that, had fallen into dogmatic views that restricted human autonomy. Um, none of that had to happen. It sadly just did. And again, he luckily for the world, read Hume, <laughs> was woken up by this and was able to develop this. The implications down the road would be, according to him, were we to follow this, we could in, begin a period of Afgarong, of, of enlightenment, in which we would, recognizing human autonomy, build a social world based upon autonomy. So again, there is a crucial history here, but it is simply one of the degree to which we properly understand human autonomy, the limits of human reason, as well as the implications for ethics. And sadly, we didn't for a long time. Now, hopefully we will. So his own historical positioning is irrelevant according to his own arguments philosophically. Now, let me immediately move to an early critic um, of this position, um, Hegel, to give another obvious example, who is by his own positioning, almost the exact opposite of everything I've mentioned. So, sticking with the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel's argument here is the phenomenology of spirit could not have been written before, right? The argument is this is only being written at the moment when absolute consciousness is being achieved, and Hegel, I mean, Hegel obviously was not a humble human being, but at least according to his own claim, he luckily is living at the moment in the development, or he would even say the unfolding of the consciousness of spirit when the point has been achieved, when you can finally have absolute knowledge and the phenomenology of spirit presents itself as that absolute spirit, in other words, that absolute knowledge recollecting its own development to that moment. So it's not that necessarily Hegel is claiming himself to be more intelligent than Aristotle, although again, he may well have thought that this is not a humble human being, but according to his own philosophy, the argument was, no, 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 it, it took an extraordinary amount of time for spirit to unfold that then allows this possible final synthesis. So at least according to Hegel's own claim, his positioning in the historical process is not only crucial, it literally defines the possibility for him of doing what he would consider true philosophy. Now, do we have examples like this from the early Chinese tradition? It, absolutely. Um, <laughs> there are many, but for reasons that will become obvious when I get farther into the discussion, let me just give two for each of these positions. Um, very different in all other respects philosophically, but comparable in terms of the claims about one's positioning in an historical process. So going back to Kant, are there figures in early China who make comparable claims that there are simply philosophical truths that could and should have been worked out at any moment in human history? And the philosophers in question are simply the one doing it, but it could have been done any time. The answer is, of course, let me give an obvious example. Um, what's up? So the argument of Woods, of course, is that Tian 
gives a set of teachings that we should be following. We should have always been following them. Um, in antiquity, we did. Then this was lost for a period of time. Now, hopefully people will follow them. If we do follow them, we will create a proper order. So as with Kant, there is a history here, but the history is simply one of people properly following these teachings or failing to do so. Um, there's no historical process that is inherent in the argument of the philosophy itself. Again, the history is simply the result of people following or failing to follow it. Are there examples like a Hegel? Um, well, yes, I've, I've argued elsewhere, so I'll be brief about it here, but I would argue that Quinanza is giving an argument very comparable to Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. So the argument of the Quinanza um, is, again, very similar to, to Hegel. The argument is, we are now giving a final synthesis. That final synthesis is being given not because we are greater sages than previous sages in human history, although here too, like Hegel, you know, <laughs> the Huaynanza authors are not humble people, so they may well have thought that, but at least according to their own claims in the post-face, they are simply giving this final synthesis because they live at a moment in human history when it is possible. So all previous human history consists of specific responses by sages to specific problems, each of those responses has resulted in more problems that subsequent sages then had to respond to as well. The result of this over time has led to a loss of an earlier harmony where humans lived within nature, but essentially were the equivalent of animals. By breaking this with sagely innovations, we have created a world of all of the innovations we know domesticated grains, clothing, warfare, the state, laws, etc. And we have developed huge amounts of philosophical understandings of how ethically to live in the world. Each one of these, however, occurred as specific responses in specific situations. And the growth of all of these over time is what is allowing at this key moment, they claim, the final synthesis building upon all of these innovations creating, therefore, they claim, a final cosmology that will recreate an earlier harmony, but now with humanity at the center, with all of the innovations that we have developed, but now in a way that will cease to break us from the larger cosmos. The claim, in other words, being the entire historical process was necessary for our doing what we are doing. This could not have been done two centuries before or a millennium before. So very much like Hegel, the final synthesis is a direct process of the, the progressive accumulation and loss of the historical process that makes possible this final moment. Now, with those as two examples, one in which historical positioning is by the own claims of the philosopher irrelevant versus one where it's everything, but everything deemed in terms of the claim of, of achieving some kind of final synthesis. What I would like to turn to now is a third position, which I, for reasons that will become obvious soon, will leave undefined for a moment. But let me give it first in very broad terms. And here again, I'll begin with some Western examples from recent times and then look back to early China. So what about that position? which is intrinsically based upon one's self-perception in terms of the historical process, one's self-perception of where one stands in an historical process, without, however, any claim to achieving a final synthesis. And the entire philosophical work comes down to how you read the past, how you read the textual tradition of the past, and how through that interpretation, you are making arguments for how we should be acting in the world. Now, my first example is one that only in part fits this description, but let me give it because he's been an important figure for, for lots of people who I think do fully fit what I'm talking about. So here's an example of someone who, again, an odd fit for what I'm talking about, um, Martin Heidegger. So at one level, you could say Heidegger really belongs in my category one, right? I mean, <laughs> here's someone who is arguing that, that 
there is an unconcealment of being, and you could argue the history of the Western world consists of the degree to which humans listened to that opening or failed to listen to it. So the pre-Socratics, of course, had a sense of truth as unconcealment from being. That, of course, is lost with Plato. The history of metaphysics is the working out of that destruction, leading to the final most extreme example in Nietzsche. And then Heidegger's claim is, I am trying once again to listen to the unconcealment of being itself. So posed that way, it's you could argue it's a lot like Kant. There is one thing we should be doing, in this case, <laughs> listen, learning to listen to the unconcealment from being. And the history of the world or the Western tradition consists of the degree to which we do or do not listen to it. Um, and again, that's obviously the key part of Heidegger, but I would argue his entire philosophical work is really aimed at another piece of this, which is given for him that argument, what he sees himself as doing is rereading the key philosophical and literary texts from the Western tradition, and to some extent, as we know, the Chinese tradition, although we unfortunately don't have his, his actual readings of the Lao Tzu, but we know he was interested in it. And through that reading, he wants to say, he is allowing the possibility of a new opening. And the argument, of course, is not that he's giving accurate readings of all the key figures. Um, if you've read his readings of Hurlderlin, um, <laughs> these are very fascinating readings and very intriguing what he's doing, but he's obviously not giving you a close reading of what you know, Hurlderlin's intent was to, to, <laughs> to argue. It's powerful readings that are based upon the argument that at this historical moment, by reading these key sets of texts, the pre-Socratics, Hurlderlin, as well as key figures, even the ones who lost the, the notion of being, but through a rereading, we can see the hints that even they themselves were not recognizing. And through that rereading of the past, we create an opening. And put that way, of course, um, you're seeing a mode of reading that would become extremely influential. Um, I'll give an obvious example of someone coming right out of this. Um, Foucault. I think Foucault is minus, needless to say, <laughs> the claims about being. This essentially is what Foucault is arguing. For Foucault, his positioning in the historical process is kind of everything. Like he would not be writing the books he wrote if he lived in a different historical epoch. He is writing the books he writes as interventions in the moment he is living in. Because of that moment, he is working through what it means to live in that moment. And to do so, it all comes down to how you read the past. So in his earlier work, that means I am writing a work at the, at the moment when the possibility of the end of humanism is here. So in the order of things, I am I'm rewriting now our history to understand and therefore give an opening to a world without that is not dominated by humanism. In his next stage, of course, doing what he calls genealogy, it is, I will look at current power structures that we are failing to understand, and through a genealogical account, both understand them, but again, for him, it's not really understanding, it's intervene in a way that will allow us to work and therefore alter the world, but without a sense, to put it mildly, that there's a vital synthesis, or even without a sense that I will tell you exactly where this will take us, but he clearly thinks it will give us an opening. And of course, then in that the final set of works, he will take the next step and say, well, he doesn't quite say, but I think by implication saying, and I will continue this work by opening up other possibilities that have existed in the Western, he works almost exclusively in the Western tradition, in the Western tradition. So notions of the self and practices of the self in ancient Greece that he won't say are real possibilities, but I think that's clearly the implication. Um, confession, which he will see as both the beginning genealogically of our own endless attempt to look within and find the self, but yet by the way he reads it, he wants to say, 
Are there other possibilities? So it all comes down to how one reads the past and how one reads the textual tradition of the past. And of course, crucial for this is, again, like Heidegger, um, it, it's not so much an accurate reading of the past he's out for, and he's not making things up, but needless to say, he will very happily read texts against the obvious authorial intent. He will very happily work through texts where a seemingly minor passing comment by in a text will suddenly become the dominant way of reading the text. And what's at stake there is not, is this an accurate reading? What is at stake is a philosophical positioning based upon where he is and therefore how we read. Now, you're probably getting with these last few sentences a sense of where I'm going, but now let me lay it out on the table. <laughs> um, I think that this third position, which I'm intentionally not giving a, a name to yet, um, plays a very significant role in the Chinese philosophical tradition. And one of the arguments I'd like to make is we should consider the practitioners of this philosophers. So when we are doing philosophical analyses, um, the figures I'm about to mention and the approaches I'm about to mention really should be part of our conversation as well. So let's then jump into, as I've done with the previous two examples, um, early Chinese examples of this third thus far ill-defined position. Um, does this occur? Well, <laughs> needless to say, um, yes. And again, my sentences have been given hints of where I'm going. So here too, let me be explicit. Um, I would like to argue that not only much of the entire commentarial tradition in Chinese history can be read along these lines, but that it really begins before what we define as commentaries. It begins in the Warring States period, goes right through the early Han, and then once we move into what we would call actual commentaries on earlier texts, this continues, which is to say the following. Um, yes, are there commentators in Chinese history who will claim that they are simply writing a commentary to understand the text they are commenting upon? The answer is yes, there are. Um, it is intriguing when that occurs, that is usually made as an explicit argument in opposition to most commentarial practice, because there is a correct, I would say, self-consciousness that this is not the typical way that commentary work, works. The typical way, I would argue, that commentary works is on the contrary, you're doing kind of the things I was mentioning Foucault was doing. You are rereading the past, in the case of a commentary, rereading a specific artifact from the past, and you are rereading it in a way based upon your current position and that rereading, if it is seen as successful, gives an opening for the current situation. Now, I've mentioned this begins before the actual development of what we would call commentaries, and I will accordingly begin my own discussion before the actual emergence of commentaries, or rather, um, putting it differently, I'll give examples that perhaps we should consider commentaries. Um, and I'll begin with the most obvious, therefore, um, Confucius. <laughs> so when we think of bringing Confucius into our philosophical discussions, we will, and quite correctly so, focus on, for example, the Analects and the discussions about humaneness, which are crucially important. But needless to say, there's a whole nother side of, of the sort of response to Confucius that comes out of things like the Spring and Autumn Annals, in which the Spring and Autumn Annals is being read in the tradition, not as Confucius telling us what happened in the state of Lu. The entire Spring and Autumn Annals, of course, is carefully giving us a rereading of the events that happened in the state of Lu to force us to rethink our understandings of human action, our understandings of the workings of, well, depending on which commentary you're, you're talking about, but, but the understanding of the role of tin, the, the role that humans should be acting in the world, our rethinking of the heavenly mandate, all of which is being laid out in the spring and autumn annals in a way, needless to say, that we could only understand by our own incredibly careful rereading of the spring and autumn annals. And since it's not going to be clear what Confucius is saying, that rereading itself becomes in the tradition 
part of the key work that you are doing to bring this teaching into the current moment. So the commentaries, therefore, do that same work at the next level. So the commentaries will present themselves as re-readings of the Spring and Autumn Annals. And again, that re-reading, yes, it's trying to get at the intent of a Confucius, but if it's successful, it is opening up proper ways of understanding human history according to one's current moment. And this is true not just of the actual commentary, say the Gongyang commentary, this is true of the way you work with and read the Spring and Autumn Annals to therefore move to an obvious <laughs> example as well, but an extreme one. Um, needless to say, um, this is exactly what Sima Qian presents himself as doing. Now, we would not call Sima Qian a commentator in the, the usual way of thinking about that, but in this <laughs> mode of talking, that is exactly what he is, right? He is presenting himself as rereading human history via the spring and autumn annals. He presents himself over and over again as a figure, not of course at the sagely level of a Confucius, but someone who is trying to reread the tradition as Confucius did, that requires an incredibly complex positioning of what Confucius was trying to do. It also requires an incredibly complex positioning of himself vis-a-vis -vis that historical process. And he constantly makes reference to the fact that this work that he is writing requires the same kind of reading that people are giving the spring and autumn medals. In other words, I'm not going to overtly give you everything I'm thinking. I'm going to reread the tradition in a way that will open up new possibilities, expecting people to read me <laughs> as understanding that, which would also mean, of course, they will be reading it in a later period, meaning that they will have to read it in different ways than the way that I'm necessarily thinking at the moment I am doing. So, in essence, what you are doing is seeing Sima Chen playing the role of a commentator to the Spring and Autumn Annals, but not in a literal sense. It's a commentary to the historical process, working with the historical process as Confucius did in his own time, looking back in the state of Lu. But the goal is not to give you an accurate historical account of what happened. The goal is to give you if you learn to read it <laughs> with the care he's wanting us to read it, a sense of, of not just what happened, but how we should think about it and how we should reread that past these are by rereading his work. This is why, to give the examples that are very well known, but worth, worth pausing on, um, his accounts will, chapter by chapter, always give you different perspectives of an event than in another chapter. He will give one position that you will wonder, is this his, this his argument? And then he will counter it a few sentences later. And the goal of this is clearly to prevent us from giving an easy reading of what happened. And I think he is trying to do the ways that you know, commentators are trying to do with the Spring and Autumn Annals it becomes, reading this work becomes a training ground for thinking in a complex way about human history and our actions within it. So to give a, an obvious example, and I <laughs> keep sticking in this talk with obvious examples to, to hopefully be able to bring in conversation, um, when he will discuss someone like Li Se, you know, the famous prime minister of the state of Qin, he will give an account that's not simply saying, oh, you know, Li Se was an evil bad guy. Um, it's actually a very complex nuanced account where he takes you through moment by moment showing when and how Lisa responded to certain moments, some of which clearly so much in were things were very powerful responses, others were horrible responses. And so much in is trying to teach us not simply to say you know, Lisa was an evil bad guy, but trying to both see Lisa as a figure responding to situations, giving us a sense of how you can respond effectively or not. And of course, at the next level, calling on us as a reader to reread that history and reread all, 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 all the other aspects of history too, to rethink our own actions in the world. And yet that the implications of this are never going to be something you could lay out 
the philosophy of Soma Chin is that we should do the following <laughs> any more than the, at least most commentarial readings or usages of the spring and autumn annals will be. And yet, I would like to argue this is absolutely philosophically based. It is not an attempt to give, again, an accurate reading of what happened. It is a philosophical rereading of the past. This, of course, is being done right after my second example that I mentioned, the Wainanza, when I was discussing that, that <laughs> second view. And this, I think, is telling, too. Um, the Wainanza, you could argue, is also doing commentary, but commentary of a very different kind. The Wainanza commentary, again, is not saying we're going to give you an accurate description of what happened. It's saying we are going to reread all of previous human history in a way that will give you an absolute guide that you can follow for all time. I mean, it literally says, I'm, or we, the, the Leo clan, we are writing this as a guide for the Leo rulers to rule the Han for all of eternity because it's the final guide that will tell them what to do. And you could say so much in has, in some ways, a comparable project in terms of its reading of the past, but of course, so much in will absolutely reject the idea that this rereading will give you some kind of final synthesis that will guide future behavior. What he kind of wants is the opposite. If the Wainans is saying, we've worked this out, now everyone else can simply follow this. In a sense, what Sima Chien is saying is, no, if you really follow this, you would know there will never be a final synthesis. You will have to continue doing this kind of rereading of the past that I am doing, following the ways Confucius was doing it, and that will have to go on constantly. Then I would like to argue, you get the development of what we would call the commentarial tradition. And I would like to argue um, this strand will continue. Now, not completely, obviously. <laughs> you will certainly get commentaries that will say on the contrary, um, let's read Confucius as the figure who put together the five Jing, the five classics, and let's do commentaries that will simply explain what Confucius's vision and intent was that we should simply follow. But you also get lots of work, some what we would classify as commentary, others that we, I think, should properly think of as simply reworkings of this mode of reading history that will completely continue. Um, Wang Chong, I think, is doing precisely this. So when one of Wang Chong's key moves precisely against an argument that we should view Confucius as the final sage who gave us a final vision of knowledge, one of Wang Chong's key moves is to say, well, no, Confucius was a sage, but all sages are limited. All sages are simply responding to certain moments, and all sages are trying to reread the past according to that moment. And we must continue that process, which means we must continue to reread the past as a Confucius was rereading the past. We follow a Confucius not because he is a perfect sage, but because he is a great sage doing what sages do, with limitations rereading the past, and we therefore do the same. And I think he is, for all the differences between, say, Wang Chong and, and a Sima Chen, I think he is arguing something very similar to a Sima Chen. Like what we are doing is rereading the past and we need that tradition to continue. Confucius is not perfect. Um, <laughs> no sage is perfect, but it requires this endless work of rereading. And I would like to argue this will continue to a significant degree as a key philosophical position for much of the rest of Chinese history, which would mean the following. Um, when we read commentaries, we, needless to say, will often read them to help us understand the text being commented upon. Um, that can be a very helpful thing to do. I would say um, <laughs> when we do so, however, most of the commentaries we are working with were not written with that intent. Most commentaries are written to be read in their entirety with the question of why is this figure reading the text that he is reading in the way that he is reading, expecting an audience that will pick up on the strategies in play and the implications, and moreover, engage in a debate that includes not just other commentaries, but other genres too. 
because almost all the commentators are also writing other texts that we should read as part of that positioning of oneself vis-a-vis -vis the tradition. Now, put this way, what I would like to argue is the following. Um, this entire tradition of reading the past, reading the textual tradition, and positioning oneself vis-a-vis -vis that reading in terms of one's own historical moment and expecting later figures to do the same, I would like to argue this has been a very significant, to put it mildly, position within the Chinese tradition. A few such figures have made it into our um, sort of pantheon of figures that we'll call Chinese philosophers. So Wang Bi, um, Zhu Xi, certainly. <laughs> we would certainly read these as being philosophical figures, but note, we do because they're the ones who are more along the lines of, of giving us a clear philosophical position, um, bordering on timeless, and certainly for Jushi, um, not just bordering, I mean, it absolutely is a timeless one. And so a Jushi will be a commentator, but he's really much more along the lines of my position one, right? He's really one saying, like, sadly, we have lost the way, but that's just... <laughs> because of our bad reading, read properly, you can understand the way as Confucius and Mencius did, and therefore a proper reading will give you access to a proper understanding of the way. Um, we will correctly read that as a philosophical position, but we tend not to think of a Sima Qian, a Wang Chong, or the many other commentarial figures as being philosophers. And I would like to argue that we should. And let me take that to make a larger comparative point. Um, my reason for beginning with modern Western examples for each of these three was in part just because these are ones that, that many of us have read and so they give us helpful examples to see the positions I'm talking about. However, um, I'm also doing it for another reason too. If one looks at earlier intellectual traditions, in other words, pre-Kant, um, are the examples I'm giving from the Chinese tradition unique? And I would argue absolutely not. I would argue um, strongly, I'm at least not aware of a commentarial tradition that is not doing the sorts of things I'm talking about. But I would also say what is intriguing about the Chinese <laughs> version of this is the openness of it. Um, <laughs> the openness of giving us like seemingly bizarre almost borderline misreadings of earlier texts, but misreadings that, again, if they work, they work because read this way, it opens up other possibilities. And it is intriguing the degree to which you are allowed to do that as a philosophical move within the Chinese tradition, which is both intriguing in itself, but I also think opens up some intriguing other ways of reading other commentarial traditions. If you look, for example, at the Western commentarial traditions, relatively few people will overtly do this, and yet I would argue it's being done all the time. <laughs> and so one of the things that's helpful by taking these Chinese moves seriously is it allows us to reflect on other commentarial traditions and ask, is perhaps some of this going on much more commonly than we usually see it is going on because it's not done quite as overtly? And I would like to argue it is. And on that point, let me simply note even a Heidegger, when he is reading the pre-Socratics and Herderlin as clearly figures who he thinks have a sense of the unconcealment of being, note too his readings of other figures too, including even an Aquinas, <laughs> where he'll give these fascinating readings where, at least between the lines, he seems to be saying Aquinas really is doing this despite Aquinas's own claims. And if we reread him properly, regardless of what Aquinas thought he was doing, we will see openings that Aquinas himself either didn't see or saw but couldn't tell us. And it doesn't even matter which of those it is. <laughs> the key is how will we read him? So let me now pull back and give the larger argument that I would hope would come out of this. Um, if there's anything to this, um, I would like for this position, um, this third position I'm still not giving a definition to, but bear with me a couple more minutes. Um, I would like for us to 
take this philosophically seriously. I think it has clearly played a significant role in 20th century and 21st century Euro-American philosophy. I think it has played an incredibly important role in the Chinese classical tradition. And again, not just the Chinese classical tradition. And it's something I think we should be actively looking at throughout all the classical traditions. I would like these positions to be brought into our philosophical discussions because they are absolutely fascinating in terms of the implications of what they're getting at when we so read them. And were we to do so, I think it would open up what has really been a dominant mode of philosophical work in most of the intellectual traditions to which we have access. And on the China side, I might add, this has not ended. <laughs> so as I'm sure is painfully obvious when I was giving my examples, this absolutely continues. And I think oftentimes we risk misreading figures who position themselves as simply giving accurate histories of the past, when in fact, I think what they're trying to do is position themselves in exactly the line we've been talking about, Confucius, Sima Qian, and continuing. And they're expecting an audience that can see their moves and understand the implications of doing so. And then let me finally get to the issue that I've been putting off for this entire talk. <laughs> um, I keep saying I'm not going to give or have been hesitant to give a name for this. By now, it's probably becoming obvious. I don't think this is a clear um, position that can be given a nice category. So what I would like to call this in as ambiguous a way as I can is a mode of doing philosophy based upon how one reads the past, how one reads the earlier textual tradition, how one positions oneself vis-a-vis -vis that textual tradition, and the entire time expecting, or I should say at least hoping for, a readership that will read the work along those lines. In other words, read it not as an account of X, what they're ostensibly talking about, but read it as a work of reading, which means if we read it, we are hopefully training ourselves to do the sorts of work that they are hoping to do as well when they were doing their work. So I can't think of a single word <laughs> that, that, that hopefully summarizes this position, but in a way, I kind of think that might be a good thing because hopefully if we come to see this as an incredibly significant intellectual position, um, part of the power of it is that it's not one that by definition can lead to a kind of easy category, because by definition it is one that is going to be ever-changing based upon one's historical position and one's constant rereading of the past. So I will close by failing to give a, a nice word to this, but hopefully in a good way. I think thinking through our entire textual tradition from this line opens up a powerful way of looking at the intellectual tradition in China, and again, not just China. Um, when I talk to people working in commentarial traditions of other areas, usually they will say, oh yeah, that's going on all the time in you know, <laughs> tradition X that I'm working on, but usually not terribly overt, which again is part of why I think it can be powerful to bring this into a larger comparative discussion, because these moves coming from the China side are often so overt <laughs> that they allow us to bring it into our larger discussions and realize that this is not just a philosophical position that, that occurs in what we call modern <laughs> Western philosophy. In fact, it has been a very significant intellectual move for much of the classical traditions that we're able to access and read. So with that as an opening statement, let us open this up for conversation and my hope has been to do this discussion in a way that hopefully will allow that conversation. So I very much look forward to thoughts, suggestions, concerns, other examples, other ways of thinking about these sorts of, of materials I'm talking about, anything. So thank you so much and let's open this up.
Thank you, Professor Pewitt, for the very rich and uh, inspiring talk, and which I think inject the vitality to the past and the transition. So now let's move on to our discussion part. Um, as Paul mentioned before, we have three commentators tonight. And our uh, first initial commentator is Yuan Ai. Um, Ai is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at Tsinghua University. And she is interested in classical Chinese philosophy and comparative philosophy, in particular topics such as nonverbal communication, silence, lafa, rhetorical questions, luck and responsibility, acceptance and courage, courage and moral expertise. So welcome, Ai. Thank you, thank you, Professor He's introduction, and thank you, Michael, for this, yeah, extremely intriguing topic. It, it it's a lot to think about. Um, I have a lot of questions actually, but I have uh, three minutes, so I'll make it very brief. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent you are also thinking, uh, in parallel with making the uh, argument, the philosophical positioning based on where you are, uh, in parallel with, uh, knowledge based on uh, where you are and your context. I think uh, for a, a, a subjective individual epistemological history, this argument is also equally um, uh, counterintuitive. Also, um, also scholars have made other efforts, also you talking about ritual to contribute the contextual knowledge to talk about the Responsive, responsive sensitivity towards situations. So th this will be my, my my question in terms of philosophy or knowledge. <laughs> yeah, and then you talk about you talk about uh, where you are, which I, I believe is extremely um, important. But if we think of a uh, feminist and understanding of knowledge in terms of positioning yourself, one emphasis is also who you are, and then when talking about who you are. If it, they, they, this becomes uh, difficult to answer in terms of a Chinese, early Chinese commentarial tradition. There will be a person instead of person, a collection of personhood, a uh, collective effort, um, like uh, Klein did with the Zhuangzi, provoke us to rethink the coherency, that sort of things. So this will be another question. Um, and not to mention, we might not, not exactly know um, their facial colors, and then, uh, yeah. And then the third one is that I agree with you that it opens up new possibilities to interpret uh, and construct knowledge. But I'm wondering, uh, you're talking about the practice of commenter, commentating things itself that opens up the knowledge, or you're talking about the intention of the commentators who tries to open up knowledge, because I think commentators trying to lock up a truth and then because of this irony, the opening of the new understanding continue to evolve. That's uh, my, uh, my, my very limited understanding of, uh, of a commentary. And Wang Bi will be a different case with other commentaries because they give definitions, uh, talking about a logic and then give a status to heaven. Um, a final question is you talk about commentary, but I, I, I'm wondering to what extent you want to include Text such as anecdotal text or parallel text. Um, yeah, it, it becomes very complicated, but um, it's also because Chinese scholarship frequently talking about copy and paste. If they see a Tsinghua manuscript talking about a figure like uh, uh, Wu Jiang, and then they will go back to, okay, Wu Jiang in Zuo Zhuan, and then there must be something in relation to Zhen Bo, Ke Duan, Yu Yan, but it's not necessarily so. So uh, commentary seems to have a more clear relationship with commentary and text, but also in existing Chinese scholarship, they also assume a close relationship of uh, a se timely sequence. So that's my 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 wonder wonders and uh, it's really great it, it got me thinking and then it's so excited to be here thank you very much great thank you so much your, your questions are absolutely wonderful and let me answer them by means of some examples um that i think will, will at least bring up the issues you, you're asking so correctly about so let me mention someone i haven't touched on yet um go home so Go Hong will explicitly 
say he is coming out of a tradition of Wang Chong, um, a statement that's often <laughs> kind of ignored just because like it, it's not easy offhand to think of two more different people um, than say a Ge Hong and a Wang Chong. Um, however, I think the reason he's making that comparison is Ge Hong is saying, no, I am doing exactly what a Wang Chong was doing, which is exactly what a Sima Qin was doing, even though the account I'm giving of the historical process is uh, at times utterly at odds and also bringing in whole tons of materials that, that you know, Wang Chong would explicitly say are just sort of silly. Um, and nonetheless, the move is to say, well, that is because to understand what I am doing, I am calling on a reader to see the implications of my now bringing in this body of materials organizing it as I have, the same work as a Wang Chong was doing, although of course I'm <laughs> in a different historical moment, which means I'm going to read it radically, radically differently. And so the reading expectation, I would argue, is that we will pick up on why those moves are being made. So we would read it not as here's Go Hong giving us an encyclopedia of existing practices of immortality. It's rather, here is Go Hong rereading the tradition according to sets of categories that are very, very surprising in many ways. We've come to take them for granted now, but at the time, very surprising. But we will understand why he's doing so in terms of his larger arguments. Now, let me also stick with that example to touch on your first question, or for actually first couple of questions. Um, absolutely. Now, when Gohong is doing this, you know, seeing himself as coming out of this tradition, but yet radically rethinking it, is he still largely operating in a world of male sages giving or in this, in his case, literally writing texts or undertaking practices that are given a textual record. And he is seeing himself as organizing this body of knowledge in a new way. I would answer, absolutely, he is. And this is part of why this process hopefully is not, well, I would say in terms of China, certainly, but I would say globally, um, should not and is not ending. Because what if we, exactly as you said, were to reread these texts without that claim of single male authorship? And Esther Klein, who's, who's joined us, I think absolutely, I would say, is in part doing exactly this. <laughs> so, so sorry to put you on the spot, Esther, but 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 Esther is both giving an account of the development of the textual tradition in China, but Esther is also a philosopher, and and I I would read, and Esther, feel free to disagree strong with what I'm about to say, um, I think Esther is also saying, let us reread the tradition without that assumption of single authors behind every single text, and how do we reread the tradition if we do so, and even how do we reread the tradition if we realize that not everyone reading these texts really did believe in a single author either, <laughs> that that has become much more of a trope in more recent scholarship, and Actually, people were very well aware of the complexities of these texts, and we need to be aware of it, and we need to be aware of the reception of these texts if we realize that fact and realize that we're not the first to realize that fact. Um, we, on the contrary, are dealing with a modern period where we've come to buy into this as some kind of historical fact, when in fact that was not the dominant view for all modes of reading in Chinese history. And absolutely, could we then bring in all of the issues we, you mentioned? Questioning notions of the self, questioning issues of gender. Absolutely, we should do that. But also, it raises the intriguing question um, here too. Would we be the first to do it? Like, Are there lots of examples in the tradition that have largely been ignored because of much more recent preoccupations um, to read everything as sort of a male world that in fact was not the way these texts were being written, received, and commented and acted upon. So I agree. I think by continuing this work, not only is it important for rethinking the tradition, I suspect it will allow us to, to find things in the tradition that we've been very, very actively ignoring. And let me use that to get to your, your final question. Um, 
I agree completely. And <laughs> so, so uh, when I use the word commentary, um, one of the things I want to do is to say, yes, let's let's certainly use the term commentary for a self-proclaimed text that is literally you know, <laughs> writing a comment on an earlier text. But you're absolutely right. I want to expand that dramatically to say, let's not restrict ourselves just to commentary in that sense. Let's look at all of these other bodies of material, hence a Samachian, a Wang Chong, a Go Hong. But let me immediately jump to your example. Um, I think this is absolutely going on in the Warring States um, period. And the form it takes is exactly the one you mentioned. So we we are misreading the tradition, or more importantly, we're misreading the way to read the tradition. <laughs> um, that we're misreading these reading practices. If we take a story about, say, you know, Yi Yin as being a story about Yi Yin, um, a story about Yi Yin is never a story about Yi Yin. <laughs> so a story about Yi Yin is meaningful because there is an audience out there that will immediately see the significance of, oh, in this story, E Yin is being read as doing X, and then he does Y. And until recently, we would sort of read that and think, okay, he did X and then Y. But as we are getting more paleographic examples, and therefore more variations of these stories, we're getting a you know, tiny fraction of what existed, but still, we're at least getting enough to get a sense of what's going on. And it all comes down to exactly what you said. So if a text says it's X and then Y, that is deeply meaningful, but meaningful in a way that we can only pick up if we begin to see all of these variations and see the significance of ascribing this to E in or not ascribing it or ascribing X and then Y as opposed to Y and then X. And at stake in that is a much larger positioning of oneself vis-a-vis -vis the past, because you're saying, oh, the proper way of reading the emergence of the Shang dynasty is, and then you give this rereading of an E.N. story as part of a larger argument that, again, we would only be able to understand once we train ourselves to be in the position, and luckily now have enough material to begin to train ourselves to be in the position, to see the implications of that rereading, which, getting back to the heart of your question, would also be to say, this mode I'm talking about even if it only centuries later will take the physical form of a genre occasionally of commentary, it's a way, I would even like to say it's really the dominant way of reading through most of the Warring States tradition. So texts like the Woods are, are kind of the odd folks out. I mean, they're the ones saying, no, 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 <laughs> that there, there is a proper understanding and we don't need to do these endlessly re endless rereadings. Although of course they are giving endless rereadings, they claim they're not, but they're standing against a tradition that is based entirely in this. It's these endless rereadings of stories, endless reinterpretations of lines of poetry, endless rereadings of the past, all of which are about arguments about how we should think about the past, how we should situate ourselves and what we should do going forward. So thank you, a wonderful set of questions that I think just cuts the heart of, of all of these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Pewitt, and thank you, I, for uh, those very substantial dialogues. Now, uh, let's welcome our second commentator, uh, Trenton Wilson. Uh, Trenton is an assistant professor of Chinese intellectual history at Princeton University. Currently, Trenton is working on a book about trust and suspicious in early Chinese intellectual and in, uh, institutional history. He also has an abiding interest in the history of classics and the classical commentary. So welcome, Trenton. Thank you, um, Kalosha, and thank you, um, Michael, for these um, really, really um, interesting remarks about the um, how to think about commentary. I wanted to, um, I, I guess I want to just put a couple of things on the table so we get into um, sort of open discussion um, and so I don't take everyone's time. But I wanted to sort of summarize one of the really great points I think that you made um, and put it in my own words and see if this is what you're actually saying, um, which is that um, sort of a basic move is that you're suggesting is that commentary is actually a way of making our life more difficult rather than easier in, in the way that we approach texts. And I think that this is a really important point to make um, in that commentary is not a 
transparent lens on the text, but it's a way of creating productive friction that you know makes these openings possible. And I think that you know you you sort of alluded to the fact that commentaries are often read as sort of a uh, I don't know we dip into them when we try to figure out we you know what does that one line in Zhuangzi mean and so we'll go to Guoxiang and then he'll tell us what it means and then you know we've 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 created this mode of reading which is actually not the mode of reading of commentary which I think you helpfully outlined um, the other point of the other part of that which is that this is also the commentaries are not meant to bring closure to the text either, which I thought was really um, um, important intervention to making. Um, so if I wanted to ask a, a sort of questions that have been on my mind um, in working with, um, especially Wang Bi and Guo Xiang and other folks. Um, so we, in the sort of comments you're making um, in response to Ai's question and Sort of bringing Esther into the conversation as well. So we have, you know, we have this whole conversation about the author function um, that's sort of important for the way that we think about text um, these days. I wonder, I wonder if you could say a bit more about the sage function that um, that I think does play a role in shaping the way that early thinkers imagine what they're doing with commentary, especially in, I mean, I mean there's probably various, there's various modes that this might appear, but certainly Wang Bi and Guo Xiang have a very, I think, strong sage function that helps them navigate the text. So that was just one question. Um, then I want to also ask um, sort of a version, you know, maybe in two different ways, the same question, um, which is if, if we're, as I think you're rightfully saying that you know, commentary is an important mode of philosophy and philosophizing in early China. I'm, I, I would love to hear you say a bit more about what, what that means in terms of how we think about things that we take for granted in, um, you know, certainly in you know, philosophy departments in this country um, about what argument is and what refutation might look like. So, you know, like, what does it mean to argue against a commentary? Like, are we, is, is this is the set of tools, the same set of tools that you use when you argue against a proposition? And, and, and what does that look like? Um, and, the, and the second way of asking the same question maybe is, you, I think, probably just for a heuristic um, in your comments, you alluded to, you know, you say that oh, Sima Qian is giving a, commentarial or philosophical reading of the past rather than an accurate representation of the past. And I, I, and maybe this is to just sort of push you to say a bit more about that. Um, you know, is that distinction possible to keep <laughs> that, you know, this, are, are we, are, should we arrive at a place where the accurate representation of the past is no longer what we're interested in? Is that, is that, or is that overstating what's going on? So those would be my sort of three questions. Great, thank you. Wonderful set of, of questions. And let me actually begin um, with your opening comment. Yes, I think that is a beautiful way of, of <laughs> discussing this material. I, I love that phrasing. Um, and yeah, just let me stick with your examples. Um, when we often read texts, literally we are reading them because they've been edited exactly along the lines that you've mentioned. So you know, it will have a line of Zhuangzi and then the editors have, have picked and selected little bits from the commentarial tradition that help us understand you know, an odd character in that, that line, but always in the mode of saying, this will help us read it more easily. <laughs> um, and I think you're exactly right. And I love the way you're phrasing it, that when you actually read the commentaries, they are doing the exact opposite. As you said, they are trying to push us out of easy ways of reading these. So you know, when one takes out of the, the very selective picking and choosing um, that, that go into modern editions, part of what's so powerful about, the, powerful about these commentarial traditions is exactly as you said, they are, they prevent us from giving easy readings. They will give a line that we think we understand, and they will give these really bizarre readings <laughs> that force you to think, oh my gosh, have I been reading this entire text, not just this line, the entire text completely wrong. And then you go to the next commentary and kabam, <laughs> just a completely different one. And 
And I think you're absolutely right. It gives you a hint of kind of what's going on in the tradition, that the goal is to take, to prevent us, as you said, from taking easy readings of these texts. Um, at the same time, of course, they can't simply give you wild readings that are simply exciting because they're wild, because those are wild but won't really make it. The ones that make it in the tradition are the ones that will give these surprising counterintuitive readings that open up something, either something about the text, something about the current moment, but ideally, of course, both. Like <laughs> something that will allow you to see something else in the text that allows you to reread something in the current moment and oftentimes something about the whole way of thinking about the tradition in a radical and new and surprising way. And that's kind of what works in the tradition. Um, even to go to Jushi is the obvious example, someone who claims, oh no, I'm simply trying to recover the way. I mean, that in practice is what he is doing. I mean, he infamously, of course, you know, puts in new characters into the text and rearranges them to give you these surprising readings that no one had ever read before. And it's all about him giving this surprising counterintuitive reading, not again, just because it's surprising and counterintuitive, but because it opens up a completely different way of reading the text and therefore reading the entire tradition. So yeah, I, I love the way you phrase it. I think that captures it beautifully. Um, and let me then turn directly on those lines to the question of the sage function. Um, I agree completely. And, and I, I say that in two ways. Um, first, let me say a few words about when and why the sage function emerges and its implications, and also how we should therefore think about it. So going back to I's earlier question about, say, the Qing Huan manuscripts, um, I mean, certainly there are notions of sages then, but but in the examples I was raising, um, not uh, the I being the I, and it was, was not, not I, I, was raising are exactly, are ones in which the sage function isn't really playing a role, right? I mean, well, I mean, Yin, you could argue as a sage, but but the re-readings of Yin, the author of that text isn't claiming, I am a sage giving a sagely re-reading of these Yin stories. Um, it's simply a way of making arguments that you give a counter-reading of Yin versus that reading of Yin. Um, and it's simply the mode of working. And that mode absolutely continues throughout the tradition, but you're also absolutely right. At a certain moment, the sage function comes in. So when Mencia says, you know, Confucius was a sage and among the key things he did was he authored the spring and autumn annals um, and thus creating the, the whole set of issues we were mentioning before, the sage function becomes absolutely crucial for the finance of the sage function is crucial for Sima Chen, um, certainly in terms of his own claims about the past, he's claiming Confucius to be a sage. I think you could easily argue that he's claiming himself to be a sage. Um, he certainly isn't claiming all the figures he's discussing are sages, but he is making a claim that to sagehood, I think he's, he literally says in so many, so he, I think he is claiming that, and he does say in so many words, I hope a future sage will see what I'm up to. So the sage function plays an absolutely crucial role throughout all of this. So I mentioned these examples to get back to the heart of your question. I think you're absolutely right. Once that sage function starts playing a role, it will fundamentally shift how these texts are being read, the claims that are being read. Um, and again, going back to Esther Klein's work, it makes it all the more intriguing when we then go back into these texts and we read them outside of that function. <laughs> we do, we read them outside of the author function, but even reread them outside of the sage function. And it does raise the intriguing question of um, what I suspect is at the heart of the question. So I'll just put it on the table um, explicitly. Um, is the sage function being seen as a function even in the early Chinese classical readings? <laughs> and I think it's a very worthwhile question to ask. In other words, do they really think in terms of sages and authors, or did they themselves think in terms of sages and authors as functions? And I suspect if we really work through the tradition, what we would see is there's a debate about that. I think some people really are committed to saying, no, 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 you know, <laughs> a single sagely author wrote this text. Um, I think others want to give that as a hermeneutic move for all sorts of reasons without necessarily being committed to the view that it's actually accurate. Now, that, of course, is a perfect segue to the question of accuracy. Um, 
you're absolutely right. I, I was given that as sort of to, to highlight where I want to go with this, but the implication would indeed be that accuracy in terms of is text X accurately representing the past or in the early example I just gave, um, you know, is this reading an accurate view of what the author really thinks. <laughs> and the reason I was saying no was to push the, the interpretive side, but I think you're right. The implication of this is this is our mistaken reading of these texts when we are even seeing the claim of accuracy as being something they're pushing against. As you said, that's not even, no, it's not what they're trying to do. It's also not what they're pushing against. That's really not what's at stake. So when we read Sima Chen, um, I certainly don't think Sima Chen is making up the events. He's you know, working from the archive and he's you know, obviously <laughs> building from the archive. Um, but I certainly do not, so he's not making things up, but I also agree with you, he's not, making a claim to give you an accurate portrayal because you know, he'll give such radically different perspectives um, any more than than you would read the spring and autumn annals to find out what you know, really happened in, <laughs> in, in the state of blue. So here too, it's an intriguing question to ask, when and where do you even get claims of accurate representation being a move? And you know, we certainly get them occasionally and that's an intriguing move, but we should read that as an intriguing move, not as the default assumption against which, say, a you know, Samachin or a Gohong are reacting, I would say, arguably, the dominant move is everyone is reading the past. And with that, let me just touch also very briefly on the introduction you gave to that, that last question. Um, I agree, in terms of philosophical departments today, um, it's intriguing how we don't do this. Um, and you're absolutely right. So we'll, if we read a Heidegger in a philosophy class, we'll emphasize the you know, philosophical claims, which will be the issues of the unconcealment of being, etc. But the ways that he will read a Hölderlin is not part of the class, unless it's seen as an exercise to show you his philosophical position on being. Um, what if we actually thought of this philosophically and brought this into our discussion? So we would be philosophically doing the work of trying to understand what is at stake when Heidegger will give these very counterintuitive readings of a Hölderlin. And if we can get there, imagine a future philosophy department where we would do the same thing for reading a so much hands rereading of a an earlier text. If we're reading, to give your example, a Wang Bi and Guo Xiang's rereading of the Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu, respectively, where we're seeing, we're not simply pulling out and saying both his philosophical position is X, Y, and Z about the way. Rather, we are seeing the philosophical work being the actual reading practices. And I think part of the difficulty of even giving a name to this third position is that it doesn't really fit into our philosophical categories. And hence, as you said, is not in our philosophy departments. And certainly there are no courses on this. And yet I think it should be. I think this should be a place where intellectual historians and philosophers are working together to work out the complex implications of this mode of reading. So thank you so much. A wonderful set of questions, both in terms of your rephrasing of the argument and the questions that you've raised, which really I think points to the, the heart of what's at stake here. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pute, and uh, thank you, Trenton. Um, may I take uh, the advantage of my position as a uh, chair and ask uh, a question? Yeah, thank you. Yes. So I'm wondering if you would consider the practice of ritual, uh, which may heritage from early China as an embodied way of reading the tradition, which can also maybe open up the proper understanding of the new situation. So uh, what, uh, the, uh, talk about the ritual and what jump out of my mind is the ritual of mourning, and which is very complicated and uh, uh, very uh, sophisticated in early China. And how could that uh, uh, ritual of mourning can inspire us from our understanding of current situation? Uh, yeah, let's you. yeah, thank you. Wonderful question. And yes, I think you're absolutely right that I think the way ritual, or one of the key ways I should say ritual operates in the classical Chinese tradition is precisely in this mode. And going back to Trenton's way of phrasing or rephrasing what I was saying in a way I love, um, where 
the work of commentary is to break us from our easy readings of a text and force us to rethink it in some mode that opens up new possibilities. I think counter to the way we often think of ritual today, that is exactly or one of the key things that ritual is doing in the classical Chinese tradition too. And I love your example, so I will stick with it. So in morning rituals, yes, I think with the way morning rituals are trying to operate is they are trying to break us from the sets of emotional responses that we will go through when we're dealing with a horrible death. And the work of the ritual is to break us from that set of sort of readings of the world, all the emotional investments that, that come with that. And it forces us to break out of that, to see all of this from different perspectives, but see is too limited a word, so I'll stick with your word. Um, it forces us to embody different ways of, of being in the world. It forces us to, to embody a different mode where I'm not simply the person, you know, devastated in sadness, horribly angry, um, horrible to those around me who are still alive, who aren't you know, dealing with this death. And I mean, this angry, don't you realize how horrible the world is? And, and, and the work of the ritual is, it's trying to, to help me even kind of force me to embody different modes of being in the world. And hence put that way, I think you're exactly right. Ritual is doing the kind of work that we're being called upon when we do commentary in this broad, broadly speaking. In other words, it's trying to help us reread the past, but again, in this, in the, in the case of ritual, really embodying that rereading very much as a rereading of a text and a rereading of an historical process and a rereading of a yin is trying to force us to do as well. So I love the analogy and I think that is exactly right, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. That's very helpful. But then I had a, a I have a follow up question. And what kind of intellectual efforts that we should make to, you know, make this new opening possible uh, from reading the past, or it's automatically happened? Uh, how can we keep the balance, you know, between the past, the here and the now, and the future? Yes, I, I think a key thing this needs to do, and it goes back to, to what Trenton was mentioning too, about the way we, we even organize our philosophy departments, um, it, and but I would say not just philosophy, needless to say, all of our departments is, yes, we need to help ourselves, but, but also help train our students to read these textual traditions and read the past in these modes and to give them a sense of what is at stake in doing so to open up this incredibly, both incredibly powerful sets of intellectual traditions around the world, but also open up the philosophical implications of so training oneself to rethink the world, rethink situations, break from common understandings that we fall into that limit our, our ways of being. And getting to the how question, um, I would love it if things that we think of as simply skills. Um, so, you know, at my institution, we have an opening class that all freshmen have to take where they're taught um, how to write. Um, and, and, and it's it's like a skill, like here's how you write. You have a topic sentence, you have an example, you have a conclusion. Um, imagine if on the contrary, we said, these skills of how to read, how to write, aren't just skills you'll get in that first you know, freshman year <laughs> opening sem semester in a very standardized, routinized way. It's just an inherent part of the curriculum where we will see reading in this very strong sense as a crucial mode of being in the world, where you're not just rereading text, you're learning to reread the world, and you're working with these incredibly powerful moves that have been made throughout the world to help train ourselves to do this. And we're trying to help our students and our, ourselves, hopefully as we go, to begin to do the same. And I think the implications of this would be extraordinary. And this isn't, this is sort of the sort of thing we do in say, you know, when we read a classical Chinese text with our students, but it would never be part of a philosophy department. It would never be part of a standard curriculum. Um, and if it were, like in other words, if this mode that was so important through so many of the intellectual traditions of the world, if this mode were to be taken seriously, 
it would just open up, I think, so much for our students in terms of not just opening up those traditions to them by definition and allowing them to understand the traditions in powerful ways, but also helping train our students too, to also read the world and read texts, but texts meaning everything, in ways that would be incredibly opening. So yes, I, I think a lot of these, these intellectual traditions are onto something and we have much to learn in the ways we think about education um, if we begin taking these practices seriously. So thank yeah. you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's so helpful. So it's not happened automatically, but we have to really put lots of intellectual efforts into it. Okay, great. Thank you. And I think that uh, uh, it's uh, time flies. So it's almost uh, 930. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Maybe we can take one or two questions from the audience if there is any. Um, you can type the question into the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and uh, 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 speak aloud. Hi, Professor, may I have some questions? Yes, I have two questions to ask. And the first is about Chinese philosophy form. You know, many people think Chinese philosophy doesn't have arguments. So it isn't uh, philosophy. Uh, even if you regard commentaries as kind of philosophical uh, creation, they really are descriptions. They are not arguments. So should we reorganize them logically? If so, how can we do this? You know, maybe some tests like Mo's or Gongxing Long's, they can be reorganized. But the analogs, for example, it is difficult to do so. My other question is about the Chinese philosophy's context. Although we can view Asian tests from different perspectives, Mm, we might be misunderstanding the test. So how can we avoid this situation? Thank you. Absolutely, wonderful set of questions. Um, and let me say, I, I agree. <laughs> so if we look at the texts from the Chinese philosophical tradition that have kind of made it into our philosophical discussions, um, it includes the ones that exactly as you said, clearly give arguments that sound philosophical in the way we usually use that term. <laughs> so, um, we'll, you know, Shunza, for example, we can absolutely bring that into a philosophy class. I mean, in America, we still have lots of problems of, of getting philosophers to take Chinese philosophy seriously. But, but, but apart from that very important problem, handing a Shunza to someone doing philosophy, even if they know relatively little about the Chinese tradition, still works. I mean, they can still read the Shunza. It is clearly making arguments they can follow and convincing them to bring it into a philosophy class is a much more doable goal. Um, I think you're exactly right. Um, bringing the materials we've been discussing, so commentaries, um, re-readings of Yi Yin, um, Go Hong, Sima Chen, um, these are not easy to bring into a philosophy department because precisely as you said, they're not making clear arguments where they say, I'm going to give you my philosophy of you know, X and, and here is my philosophy. Um, the only way to get at what they're getting at is to do the complex mode of reading that they are then trying, I mean, they're trying to do a complex mode of reading and calling on us to do the same. And even if we look at the figures who are doing this in the Western tradition, um, I mentioned Foucault, for example, even Foucault, if Foucault is taught in a philosophy department, it will usually involve pulling out the clear arguments that, say, in the 1970s, he was making about the workings of power. So Foucault's philosophy of power is X, Y, and Z. But if you really read you know, where that's coming from, that the the mid-70s book, Discipline and Punish. Um, yes, he's saying that, but he's saying that in the form of a genealogy calling on us to rethink our understandings of the way power works in what we would call a modern liberal society. And the whole argument philosophically doesn't really work if it's pulled out of the way he's trying to read the tradition. So even in an example of a figure who would be recognized in a philosophy department as a philosopher, he's really not being read along the lines that we're discussing. So all of this cuts to the heart of your question. Um, how to do this is going to be incredibly difficult, but I think the key 
opening move is exactly as you were saying. We need to realize that that a mode of reading is an argument, just not an argument along the lines that we usually use that <laughs> that term. It's it's the way that you will reread the past. You, there is an argument there, but it's not an argument saying my position on X is the following. I'm disagreeing with this person and that person who had different views on X. Here's where I think they're wrong. Um, the only way to really see what's going on is to do the work of hopefully reading with the care that they are reading and seeing the implications of that. Now, bringing this into our mode of, of education is going to be incredibly difficult, but again, I think incredibly important because this really is, um, it's not just that a few people in the continental tradition have been doing this. Um, I would like to argue it's been really a, a dominant mode of intellectual work in most of the intellectual traditions to which we have access, um, certainly including the classical Chinese tradition. So it's a wonderful question and I don't have an easy answer as to how we're going to do it. And yet I think it is incredibly important to do because it just opens up, again, not just so much intellectual work in, in um, <laughs> literally the past 2,500 years, but also opens up so many powerful ways of, of training ourselves and our students to read and think critically about the world. So thank you, it's a wonderful question. Thank you. I know uh, many audience may still have questions and comments, but uh, time is up. I'm sorry that we have to call it a day. And thank you again, Professor Pewitt, for this wonderful talk. And thank you, I and uh, Trenton, for the wonderful discussion. And for me, it has been a wonderful night. So thank you all. And uh, uh, Paul, are you still there? You want to say something before we close? Oh, okay, no, here you uh, are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, just that that was wonderful. Um, thanks, Professor Pewitt, and thanks for ev everyone. Um, it's actually, uh, we have a, a small conference in the works, Sahai Weishia, and this is basically exactly the topic. Um, so uh, yeah, Professor Pewitt, not to put you on the spot, but I was just going to send you an email to ask you if you have five minutes after this um, to talk with you about that, because yeah, this is basically exactly the topic of the conference. So. Um, and I, yeah. I, wonderful. I do indeed. So yes, let's do talk. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, great, great. Yeah. So um, yeah, everyone, thanks for being here. And um, as I said, this recording will be on the website next week, uh, on our YouTube page next week. And you can see um, our, I put in the chat, uh, uh, our calendar of events. So um, hope to see you again in a couple weeks. Thanks, everyone. And let me also say thanks to all of you, Paul. This has been wonderful. Gene, thank you so much. Trent and I, your questions and comments were fantastic. And to all of you, thank you for being here. This is such an exciting way to bring people together to talk. So thank you all so much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure thank is mine. See you all Bye. soon. <laughs> Bye.